morning. It just looks incredible watching the bees bring in all these different flavors of honey in this window here. But what we're seeing in this hive is quite a lot of bees. So when they're really crowded in here and if you take the windows off and it's really crowded in the windows as well, then you know it's time to do something about it. So if we leave them really crowded, they're likely to swarm. We're past swarm season now, so they're less likely, but even so, you can get some late swarms. So when you see crowds like this, it's time to either take a split or add another super or brood box. So today we're going to add another super to the hive, which is something we promised to do. So let's get straight into it. We're going to be doing some beekeeping and as per usual, questions in the comments and we'll get to answering those and Trace who some of you know if you phone up the office here will be uh, answering Hi. those questions <laughs> as they come in so let's get right into it we'll take off the roof of the hive first and it's also important to protect yourself from stings so another thing to do is get your smoker going so we got that going a little earlier I'm going to be going without gloves, but if you're new to beekeeping, wear your gloves. A couple of puffs of smoke in the entrance of the hive. And then you can leave that smoker just by the front there. So I'm going to take the roof off here and put that aside. And I might just use that as my place to get the super prepared. Now, the inner cover here between the boxes is going to be removed, but not quite yet. First, we're going to prepare our flow hive super, make sure all the cells are ready for the bees. So to do that, we remove these covers, we get our flow key, and it's as simple as taking out these top caps, and then using this flow key, inserting it into the top slot you can see there's two slots there insert it into the top one give it a turn now that's important because the parts may have moved in transit and you don't want cells like this or the bees won't be able to wax them up and fill them full of nectar okay so we just go along do this to each frame it's a it's a quick process but an important one and that way we know all the cells are ready for the bees to start using. Make sure you put those caps back in, living up in the top there. And the next uh, thing after that is to get your frames nice and in line to form the beautiful observation window we were looking at earlier here. Because you don't want spaces for the bees to get out. You want them all lined up nicely and no spaces here. Um, for the bees to get out. But if, if one's pushed back and one's forward, then you might find bees will escape between them. So uh, to do that, what we need to do, and I'll just turn this around so you can see that, is there's a little screw at the back here. You can see that one there. You just adjust that out a little and that will push it forward. And that adjustment screw is because there's lots of different size boxes in the world and we wanted it to be able to suit all of the different um, slight variations and that just pushes the frame forward and when they're all pushed forward they form the nice window so it's a simple process so our super is now ready so the next thing we're going to do is take the inner cover off the hive don't forget if you've got questions put them in the comments we'll get to answering those and what we're going to do is take this off so we can remove that inner cover but first Make sure you're protecting yourself to minimise bee stings. Okay, so middle zip up, then comes the side zips, and here we go. And the Velcro over the top. Okay, hive tool that comes with our suits and jackets. You get under here and lever it. Now the bees will likely stick this all together. So we're going to just use the tool to pry their propolis, which is their glue. It's the, they collect tree resins to make that propolis. And 
they glue everything together so you'll need to slowly pry the inner cover off like that you can see there the the propolis that's the brown one and that you can actually scrape off and chew on it's great if you've got a cold or something it's got anti bacterial properties and uh, propolis is used widely in medicine and here you can see some bright yellow beeswax so the bees are onto some interesting um, pollen and nectar sources to to um, get that yellow color isn't that amazing so because we're above the excluder the queen can't be on here so we don't need to worry too much about looking for the queen we'll just rest that up against the hive now we've already established in the side windows that there's a lot of bees in this box so they're ready for another box or as said earlier we could take a split often i prefer to take a split and run your hives a bit smaller but we had some questions about double supers so we thought why not just add a second flow super to this hive the colony's strong enough there's a nectar flow on and they'll get up there and create a whole nother box of honey to harvest on top so all we need to do now is choose a moment when there's no bees around the edge and put the super right on top so i've got one little bee here i'm just going to move you out of the way and that's it we now have a double supered flow hive and the bees will get up there appreciate the extra space they'll be less likely to swarm and you'll have twice as many frames to harvest so that can be a wonderful way to go as well the inner cover then can go right on top i don't want to squash any bees so i'm going to just uh, brush them off the inner cover actually i'm going to shake them off so if you're trying to get bees off something in most things in beekeeping are a nice slow movement but in this case we're going to do a fast movement just to shake them all off like this and there we go most of the bees are off and we can now put it on without squashing any bees there we go and last but not least the roof goes on top which gives them a bit of extra shade against this hot sun that we have right now it's quite a quite a hot day here our little covers can go on now and we can enjoy the process of watching the bees get up there and do their thing mixing up all the flow frames and uh, producing their honey any questions yes see there are lots of people um, coming in asking lots of questions one is does that the bottom super have to be full before you add that top super look it doesn't there's no real rules about it but it would make sense because if you just add heaps of space for the bees you're going to be disappointed that they they don't fill that box up and it's best if you want action on the flow frames to have a lot of bees in the box and if you haven't got many it'll be a very slow process of getting to this beautiful stage where you can see the honey and it's ready to harvest Fantastic. Cedar Rum, we've got Kurt who's calling in from Trinidad. He was first question off the cab off the rank. Wondering, um, they have Africanised bees. Are they difficult to deal with? Okay, Africanised bees are, um, I'm not an expert, we don't have them in Australia, but I have heard some crazy stories about how um, the aggressive traits of Africanised bees. So you have to find out from your local beekeepers whether there's issues you'll need to deal with there and safety is really important so um, make sure you're staying safe if, if you've got Africanized bees but the answer is yes Africanized bees have been tested and will quite happily fill the flow frames great um, a lot of people feeling the love I think for our customer support team and thanking everyone for always replying to their answers and their questions so so uh, a shout fantastic. out for the customer support team. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, it's all about getting your questions answered. If we can help people get started in this wonderful thing and look after bees, then that's when we get the beautiful reward of not only pollination, but honey as well. So it's all about learning and learning and learning some more and, uh, and looking after bees.
<laughs> Great, Cameron's wanting to know, um, loving the Western Red Cedar Hive, but just I'm not quite sure where Cameron's calling in from, but wondering what stains and oils we have used on it and what we would recommend and why we paint the roof. Okay, we paint the roof because that gets the most weather, the sun beats down on it, the, um, the, you, you might get issues with it starting to buckle and warp if it's not sealed. And I would really recommend painting uh, top and bottom. This hive, that hasn't been done, so it'll be slightly more prone to the shingles warping because you can get moisture differences either, either side. So there's a little tip there, paint your shingles before you put them on. That'll give you the best um, weather protection. You can even add sealant in between these parts here and under the ridge cap and that will provide an even better uh, sealant or you can get lots of paint in there that will help too. So as far as the, the box goes, if you're using the Western Red Cedar Wood, you can uh, keep it looking like this beautiful natural wood tone. However, you're going to need to, uh, to really give it a bit of TLC from time to time if you want to keep it looking like that. Because if you, uh, if you think about what's going on, wood is a natural thing and the earth and the elements are trying to turn it back into the earth. If you go up the row here, you'll find um, different examples of the wood. There's such beautiful wood tones from dark to light. So typically this is a, um, this is a linseed oil we've used and, and um, it's one that's uh, got a solvent in it so it really soaks in. It's just from the local hardware store. And um, it, uh, if you reapply it every six or 12 months and give it a little rub back, you can keep it looking good for years. Um, if you come up here, you can see this is a painted one here and that's another way to go. You can get, get uh, creative with your artworks. This one's been here for years now with this beautiful artwork on it and that will also keep it looking good. This is our Aracaria model and we recommend painting that. The Western Red Cedar has natural properties to resist mildew and things like that um, on the outside. The mildew doesn't damage your box but it just doesn't look so good. Whereas the, the Aracaria doesn't so it will tend to get the, that mildew on the outside um, in the first uh, um, three to six months. So painting the other wood types, be the Aracaria or Polonia, is a better idea. If you want to keep that beautiful natural wood look then the cedar is the go. Okay, any more questions? Yeah, fantastic cedar. Um, David's wondering, if your flow frames have been sitting for a while out of the super, do you need to clean them before you add them? And if you do, what do you suggest they clean them with? Okay, so the bees, while well, the flow frames are inside the hive, generally keep them quite clean. Of course, you'll get um, wax and propolis build up, which will, which will change the, the look, but to the bees, they're clean. Now, if you then, take your flow frames off for whatever reason, perhaps your colony got weak and it, it wasn't big enough to support the flow frame or perhaps you've, you've got a, a um, long winter and you're wanting to downsize your hive for the winter. Then uh, if you're in a humid climate you can get, you can get the, the frames starting to go a, a bit, um, bit mouldy, a bit of um, uh, rodents could get to them etc and you might want to clean them before putting them back in. Now, you can, there's a few things you can do to clean them. One is um, just get a hot hose from your laundry because it'll help soften the wax as well. Set the frames into open position so that the water can flow through and just give them a good wash out and then um, let them dry. Once they're dried, you can put them back in and the bees will do the rest of the work. If you've got a freezer, that's a better way to keep your frames so that they stay good. So if you're taking frames off, particularly if they've got a bit of nectar in them, you could put them in a freezer and that'll stay like they are, ready to go on in the springtime. So that's, a, that's another option. Beekeepers um, on a commercial scale will often have big freezers for their stickies and their frames in order to keep them good for when they go back onto the uh, hives again. Um, in terms of the trough area down here, that um, I find if you clean out that little leak back point here, it stays 
um, stays clear and clean enough. If you find there's, there's build up in there and you want to clean it out, put a, a damp cloth on your flow key and just give it a clean out prior to you harvesting it. So that's about all in cleaning flow frames. Great. Um, Frederick Dunn's just joined us and of course he's saying it's so interesting to watch us here because they are completely covered in snow in wow. the States. I know. It's amazing isn't it? This, the differences across the world from hot deserts to, to snow all at the same time and, and um, here we are as a big beekeeping community tuning in from all of those different environments. <laughs> Fantastic. Candy's asking, um, is it advised to put some burr comb on the frames to encourage the bees into the super? Okay, that is something you, you can do. It's something that I almost never do, apart from to show you how to do it. But if you're finding the bees are taking a long time to start building on the flow frames, then by all means scrape a bit of burr comb off the uh, top of the brood box. If the the brood box is ready for a super then it'll probably be building comb on top just like this one was. Um, they were building it on top of this one as well. And you can scrape that off and just mash it into the flow frame face. Do it in the window so you can enjoy watching them and what you'll find is they'll recycle that wax and quite quickly distribute that on the flow frame. And if there's no nectar flow and your colony's not strong enough it won't make honey appear in your frames, but it'll get them started and, and you'll be able to watch that process. So the best recipe is a strong colony, lots of bees and a nectar flow, and then it happens really quickly. If you come up to this hive over here, you can have a look in this window. And this is a, a super we've just uh, added a couple of weeks ago. And you can see they're just getting started. If you tune in right on this bit here, you can see the wax right down the cells as they're adding their wax and completing the cell pattern uh, ready to, to start nectar. So that's what it looks like when they're just getting started. We didn't add any wax and they're creating it themselves. So away they go. If the nectar flow continues, they will keep going, finish all those cells and then start uh, depositing nectar and producing honey. Great. Thor um, is asking, and he's in the Blue Mountains, which is in Australia. Um, just wondering, he's just received the flow hive, pretty excited, and just wondering, is it too late now to put in a swarm or a nuke in the Blue Mountains? Okay, Blue Mountains does get a bit of a cold winter, but here we are, and we've got, um, we've got our, our summer, a lot of summer left, so um, I wouldn't say it would be too late. You'd be getting quite big flows from all of those eucalypts in the Blue Mountains. It's really nice honey. So I would get, get uh, uh, some bees in there as quick as you can and let them really uh, make use of the rest of the, the summer there in the Blue Mountains. Of course, if you can get hold of a whole hive, sometimes you can find them online, people selling a um, whole hive, whether it be a conventional one or a flow hive or what have you. and um, then you're starting with a colony that's already big and put that straight in will give you best results because they'll, they'll get into it and they'll have big numbers to collect that nectar. However, um, a nuke is a good way to start as well because you've got half the frames in the brood box already with wax, already with pollen, already with a queen laying, already with brood and all they need to do is expand from there and if there's nectar in the flowers then they will expand uh, quite quickly so I would get into it. Great, go for it Thor. Um, Cedar you said right at the start that you, um, if you're new to beekeeping you should put your gloves on but then uh, Matt's wondering does that mean eventually you either don't get stung or do you just feel a little bit more comfortable? That's a great question. So um, if you don't wear gloves you will get stung on the hands more often than wearing gloves. So that's what it's about until you, until you get comfortable with bees, until you uh, learn about your hive and learn what they sound like and look like when they're likely to sting, then you can start experimenting with not wearing your gloves. But I'd recommend wearing them first until you really start to tune in on what it looks like when they're in a stinging mood. That way you'll get less stings. Having said that, 
even for an experienced beekeeper, I get stung on the hands every so often because I accidentally uh, put my hand on a bee on, as, I, as I put it around the frame, or perhaps I've been speaking for way too long on a Facebook Live and they, they, they're getting over it and they'll come and give me a sting on the hand. So, so um, if you don't want any stings, um, it's probably impossible to completely avoid it in beekeeping, but you can try. And, and that means wearing a good bee suit and your gloves as well. So there are a few comments coming in going, um, would you ever put windows or could people cut out their own windows and put them in their brood box? You certainly can, um, by all means. I love people who get in there and experiment and make their, make their designs. So um, and it's always fascinating to see if you've, if you've got a nice design, send in a picture. We actually thought in the beginning that lots of people would uh, get our flow frames and adapt them to their conventional boxes. So we, we even um, put, put diagrams and measurements for them to do their cutouts and so on. And it was a surprise to us to see that most people just wanted it done for them and wanted the whole thing complete. So um, uh, by all means, get in there and experiment. You can add flow frames to, to any beehive, even a top bar hive if you want to get really creative. Um, and as to cutting windows, you can certainly uh, cut windows with a, a jigsaw. There's a little technique, it's a little bit tricky, but um, if, you, uh, if you don't want to drill a hole to start your jigsaw, then you can do what's called a plunge cut, where you basically get your jigsaw, and there's your piece of wood, and you get it going at high speed and you just let it dig in as you move it down, that way you don't have that hole on the edge of your window. But uh, you might want to, if, if you're not used to doing that kind of thing, you might want a little bit of help there. Nice idea, the plunge cut, I like that. <laughs> um, Cedar John's from Coffs Harbour, uh, it's a bit of a long one, he's, he's had his bees, they're going nuts, and in the last two weeks he's just noticed two, maybe three of his flow frames are all capped and ready to go. But the, out, the sides are only about a third full. He's wondering if he harvests those ones that are full on the weekend, will that give the, his bees enough room or does he need to actually split them? He's worried that his bees, that there's going to be too many bees in his super. Okay, so the triggers for swarming, uh, a minor trigger is whether they've got space to store honey. So yes, that will help a little bit, harvesting the honey and giving them more work to do. But the major one is actually in the brood box where there's not enough room to lay any eggs. Now, if you harvest some out of the brood box, they might move some of the honey from the bottom to the top, freeing up some space to eggs. So it does help a bit. Uh, so if you do want to limit their swarming behavior, you'll need to get into the brood box and give them some blank frames. So if you're using uh, comb guides, naturally drawn combs, then you can just cut the wax and honey out of some of the side ones and move them into the centre and enjoy eating that honeycomb. Or you could, uh, if you're using foundation, you'll need to prepare those and swap them out um, and shuffle the frames so you've got the new ones in the centre and that'll limit your swarming. Or you could take a split, as you said, or you could add another brood box or another super. So there's your options. Um, and it really depends, this time of year in Australia, they'll be less likely to swarm. Swarm season is generally the first uh, six weeks of spring and then you get a lot less swarming activity after that. The, if you look in the windows and they're really crowded, you can't even see the combs like we were discussing earlier on this hive, then that's the time to, um, to, to do something about it um, in case they might be going to swarm. You can see there a lot of bees in the window. You can still see the, the frame a little bit, so they're not as packed as they sometimes get, but certainly good numbers of bees. And we've got that extra box on top that they'll be starting to use soon. They um, haven't ventured up there much yet, but soon they will. Thanks for the question. Right, so Cedar, could you add um, like another brood box as a super on the top of the super and so it becomes full of honeycomb and would that sort of give the bees more space as well? Certainly can but you wouldn't call it a brood box you'd yeah. call it a super so that would be a conventional super with your wood 
frames or your wooden foundation frames depending on what you want to do and the bees will then get up there and create some honeycomb for you. Typically if people are collecting just for honeycomb they'll put a, a three quarter or a half size box on and you can get those and add them to your hive as well. And, and would you add that on the top cedar? Or? You, you can, you can add that just right on top. If you want it to be a brood box then you do it underneath the excluder here. So in between the brood box and the excluder oh. and then you would call it a brood box. Fantastic, that was actually a question I wanted answered so <laughs> thanks for that. Cedar, is it best to leave a water supply nearby if you've got a pool to stop your bees from drowning in the swimming pool? Okay, um, you do often see bees um, dying by the water's edge or in the pool. Now you have to keep in mind that bees have a massive turnover rate. If you've got a strong hive with 50,000 bees and they're in foraging season, every four to six weeks there'll be 50,000 bees that are dying, 50,000 bees that have emerged. That's a lot. And the last job they do is collect water. So you'll often find bees that are uh, at the end of their life collecting water and that's why you see them tattered and slow um, uh, collecting water. And um, if you don't want them to collect water from your pool, then giving them a, a, another water source. And Fred Dunn, who might be still watching, has got a, a video titled um, something like Bees Need Minerals. And he did some great experiments to show that bees will go after salty water before they'll go after fresh water. And he swapped them around and then they would keep following the salty one. So, so um, if you are giving them another water source, add a, a teaspoon of salt to your container of water and that way the bees will prefer that over the hopefully less salty water in your swimming pool. Fantastic. Um, Melissa's coming in and saying four days she harvested 18 jars of honey, so she's pretty stoked. 18 jars, excellent. Yeah. Good to hear. Yeah. What was the flavour like? Was I it know, white exactly. or dark, aromatic or malty? <laughs> <laughs> um, Cedar Kelly's asking, she's got the flow hive, it's all happening, so how do you now find out where to get your bees from? Okay, so the best spot to get bees is locally, so to do that look up your local bee breeders and there's a few different ways to go about it. You can either purchase bees or you can get bees off a friend. And we've got great videos on showing you how to start with the, with the four different methods, actually five. So one is purchase a nucleus, which is the way I would recommend. It's the easiest way to go. You've got an already going little hive. All you need to do get in your bee suit, get your smoker out, transfer them to your brood box, look after them and they'll grow. The next one is a package. Now a package can arrive in the mail, so an advantage of that is you don't need to go and pick them up from the bee breeder. However, uh, a package is um, like an artificial swarm, so they're a step back from a nucleus, which is an already going hive with pollen, nectar and brood stores in the frames. So a package typically will come with a queen and uh, the queen goes in there with the package and away they'll go from, from that. And we've got videos showing you how to do that. If you have a look at the beekeeper.org then we've got detailed videos on taking you from square, run, square one all the way through to a deep scientific knowledge of beekeeping. So tune in on that, it's free to try and you've, you've um, got a great beekeeping course there with experts from all over the world contributing to that. Um, there's also videos on our Facebook Live of various different methods as well. Um, if you want to catch a swarm, we've got videos showing you how to do that and that's best in the springtime, you'll find swarms around. And another way is to uh, take a split. So if somebody's got a busy hive like this, you'll actually be doing them a favour to take out some of the brood frames and put them into your box and you can start like that. Provided there's eggs down the cells the bees can raise a queen from or if you're 
uh, can identify which box the queen is in, then you can um, take some frames without the queen and order a specific queen from a queen breeder, which might have great hygienic traits, or productive traits, or gentle traits, whatever you want to request from the breeder. So there's a few options for you. Okay, um, questions coming in. If we have a look down the cells here, you can see the bees are just starting to work them already because there's a lot of bees in between these frames. For those that are just tuning in today, we were adding another super to your flow hive, which is something you can do if you want to. And already they're starting to get heads down cells and starting their amazing work of waxing up those frames, but we won't expect it to happen overnight. We'll, it, we'll expect a gradual transition as the colony expands into this super now that they have. Sorry, okay. Steve, was, my computer I think got hot and it just had a meltdown, so <laughs> I, I'm good now. I was going for backup. So, um, okay. Um, Cedar, would you recommend having two brood boxes on when you first start just to make the colony really strong? It's something you certainly can do. However, I would recommend just starting with a single brood box and a single super like you see us doing, and that'll give you the fastest action in terms of bees filling your flow frames. You'll find if you put lots of boxes that it'll take some time before the colony's big enough really to want that extra space and area to store honey. So you might get a bit impatient if you've got too many boxes. What you want to do is um, compress them a little bit so that uh, they start working on the flow frames sooner. Great, this is a, this is a great one from Brian. Just wondering, how, what's the difference between a hive being robbed or new bees doing their orientation flight? Um, there, he's recently done a mm. split and he's just sort of wondering, is it being robbed or is it the new bees? Okay, so, so that's a good question and it can it can be a uh, hard one to tell, but here is what you need to look for. When a hive's being robbed, there'll be bees coming from other hives and they don't necessarily know where the entrance is. They've been told the information by the dance of the rubber bees coming back of where the hive is, but not exactly where the entrance is. So they'll tend to come to the hive and they'll be looking for a way in, in every little crack and crevice. And you'll see see a kind of a frantic movement. These bees, they're, they're keen robber bees and they want to get into that hive and they're really looking for every crack and crevice. So if you see that behaviour, what you have is robbing and you'll need to stop that behaviour, reduce the entrance down to just one bee wide. We showed you that in our live recently just by putting some of this grass mulch in the front. Lock the entrance down and that way your bees will be able to defend their better. So that's the main one. You can also look at the landing board and if you see fights happening where your guard bees are trying to fend off the robbers, you'll see full tussles and rolls and them falling off the landing board. That is another sign as well. So keep a look out. You don't want your hive to be robbed out or it will likely uh, perish. Right. Um, and Cedar, coming back to that, the salty water, Fred, Frederick Dunn's come in and said, yep, a teaspoon per quart of salt and the bees get what they need. He said it's saying it's also valuable to just leave them some fresh water with no salt as well. Okay, good tips there from yeah. Fred. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> Cedar, would, in the really cold, obviously we've got a few customers here and it's snowing, could you put insulation under the roof, between the roof and the inner cover? You certainly can, and some people will do that. Um, some people will do complete wraps over the winter time, but in here is, is uh, there's plenty of room here to, to add some extra insulation. This, this um, wood has an insulating effect in itself, but what you might like to do is put some insulation material under here, which could be uh, an old uh, polyester stuffing pillow or uh, some house insulation. You might like to put a, um, a waterproof layer here, so condensation or any um, weather that comes through your shingles doesn't get on your inner cover and then some insulation above that. You, you could cut an old styrofoam box and uh, use that. That could be a nice layer under the roof. 
I'm not an expert in cold climates because we live in a subtropical region, but there is some great videos. Fred can probably uh, post some more on cold climate beekeeping and we have more videos for you at thebeekeeper.org. Um, Graham's asking, do this, are some stings worse than others? And he's wondering, do you think the food affects the protein makeup of the sting fluid, Dr. Cedar? Okay, <laughs> now if you've got more information on that, please chime in on the thread. I have noticed that sometimes your sting can be just almost a nothing. It's not much more than a, a mozzie bite. And other times it can be quite painful. Sometimes it swells, sometimes it doesn't. So um, it really, really does depend, I imagine, on how much venom goes in, uh, the place on your body, how your body reacts, and the strength of the venom from that bee. Right. Uh, Tareen's asking, does the comb in the brood box ever get too old and need to be removed for the bees to create new comb on a brood frame? It's a good idea to cycle out the old combs and after they've been in the hive for a couple of seasons, it's a good idea to start cycling them out. So what that means is moving some of the frames from the centre of your brood box towards the edge. Once the bees have filled them with honey, which they typically do on the edges of the hive, you can then remove that. You can cut out the honeycomb if it's naturally drawn straight in the field and put your frame back in. And when you put it back in, you could move it towards the centre. So some brand new area for the bees to build and the queen to lay. Now, if there's a little bit of brood in the outer frames, which sometimes there can be, and you then don't want to take that out of the hive. So there's a few things you can do there. If you've got the hybrid, you could move that up to the, uh, to the hybrid box on the edge. There's space for them. Or if you've got a setup like this, you could even put your frame with a little bit of brood right under the roof. Now, that little smoke is just uh, charging away there. So you can fit a frame under the roof here. You'd then pull out this cap, allow those bees to emerge. The nurse bees will come up, look after that brood, and uh, a, a week or two later, there'll be no brood left in it, and you can take that frame away. So that's another thing you can do if you're looking uh, for a place for brood to emerge in one of your outer frames. Just prop it up a little bit so that uh, the comb isn't resting right on the roof. You want um, at least six millimetres gap between this face and uh, the uh, surface of the comb for the bees to work it. So you know what, what's the best method if you want to check your brood box but you have the super on top? Okay, so you will need to take the super off. Now, I have experimented with running them the other way around, so the brood's on top and the super's underneath, because we don't need to pull out the honey frames so much. Like in the conventional harvesting, you're pulling out the honey frames more than the brood, so it makes sense to have the honey on top. However, by all means, experiment with that. But what I've found is the bees will be slightly less enthusiastic to fill them with honey if the honey's down the bottom and the brood's up the top. And while you can get them to do it, you'll probably get um, slightly less honey in that configuration, but I haven't experimented with it enough, so if you want to try it, by all means, it certainly does allow for easy access to the brood. But generally what beekeepers do is they just lift the boxes off. If you find they're heavy and full of honey and, and uh, you're not um, strong enough to do that, then make sure you get some help. Well, if you don't have help, of course, you can pull out each individual frame, set them aside, and that'll make it nice and light to lift off the honey super and give you access to the brood frames. Oh, great, great idea. Um, Cedar, is our ideal supers compatible with flow hive and have flow hive twos and have you ever used them on your hives? So the flow frames are a standard uh, this one's compatible with an eight frame Langstroth and we also have the ones compatible with a set with a ten frame Langstroth. So we call that the flow six because the flow frames are wider 
bees generally make a wider comb if they're away from the brood nest. So we've followed suit with that. So what it means is a flow uh, six is compatible with the eight frame length trough and the flow seven is compatible with the 10 frame length trough. And then you can put another box on top. Sometimes you'll find that the, the roof won't quite go on properly, but you could just sit it on top at that point. Um, depending on the size of the box you're adding. So a few, um, a few things you can do there, or you could add your ideal um, underneath your flow frames, and that would work as well. And it is a popular thing to do to collect a bit of honeycomb. Right. So you know, if you've just got a nuke and you're wanting to put it into your flow hive, is it better to do it in the morning or afternoon? Is there a better time? Generally the best time for beekeeping is mid-morning to mid-afternoon on a sunny day that's not too windy. Having said all that, it doesn't always line up with your schedule and you end up beekeeping at all sorts of times. But that's when the bees will be most calm. They're busy doing their foraging work. A lot of the bees are out and it makes it easier to work your hive. Louis got a, from Melbourne, got one of our classic hives. So it has the, the baseboard with the core flute slider. What's, the, what's um, a good way to start trapping the beetles um, as he doesn't have the tray like the Flow Hive 2? Okay, so there's a few things you can do. You can catch beetles by just making your own tray. You might want to even get the, the lid off a Tupperware container, add a bit of oil to it and slide it in between the core flute slider and the mesh. So you put the core flute slider in the lower position, add a little tray and catch some beetles that way. Uh, I've seen some people get out their um, uh, handy skills and create their own tray by getting the core flute and siliconing on some edges to it to create a tray that uh, can slide right in there. So you could do that. Um, you could also go down the route of the uh, fluffy tablecloth. So if you go to a, a um, takeaway place they often have those um, tablecloths covering them which are kind of a vinyl cover. You can get that material down at your local uh, um, textile store and on the underside it has this fluffy texture. If you're going to, to use that to catch beetles because they get their legs stuck in the fluff then make sure you stick it well to the core flute slider. If the bees are able to reach it they'll start ripping it up through the, the mesh. So you put your core flute slider in the lower position, get some double sided tape or some glue and glue that fluffy material to it and you can catch a bunch of beetles that way as well. You can also um, get other types of beetle traps to add uh, in between your frames in hives from conventional beekeeping stores. Great. Uh, Melody's calling in from snow covered Michigan in the USA. Wow. Um, so hard to imagine. Just wondering how often um, should they be um, inspecting their brood box um, in spring, summer and fall? And also, at, is it, if it's too cold, should you not be opening your brood box? I can definitely do with some snow here up yeah. now. It's, <laughs> it's very hot. It's hard to believe. Um, I definitely, uh, a bit of snow would be helpful. Now, um, so generally beekeepers go through a bit of a cycle of uh, inspecting and we don't have that the same issues here as you have in Michigan. We don't have the varroa mites so that lessens how often we need to manage our hives. Um, however there's different strategies beekeepers use and you'll need to find out from your local beekeepers what you should be doing and get some help with that management. In some cases uh, like in um, Germany now that they're saying that it's good to get into your hive weekly during the um, foraging season and make sure you're managing for pests and diseases. Um, but that's on, on the extreme uh, case. But by all means, you can get in there if you're really keen to learn about beekeeping. It's a wonderful thing to, to learn and watch continually to, to see what the bees are doing. Um, but uh, generally, it's a lot longer than that in between getting in there and checking on your brood for pests and diseases. Fantastic. Um, I, I, Fred's just saying that he thinks that this stream's finished, but it doesn't look like it here, so I think we should keep going. Um, Cedar, does, can you over-inspect your brood box? Like, does it annoy the bees? 
Um, certainly it can annoy the bees, especially if you're doing it on um, grey, rainy or windy days. They, they won't like that. So you want to be careful of chilling your brood and uh, that relates to the previous question. You, you wouldn't be inspecting your brood in the winter time. Now, you want to make sure they have enough stores prior to winter. Uh, if you don't, you should feed them and then uh, you, you basically want to leave them be. If you're pulling them apart, um, that'll make it harder for your bees during those winter months. So you can over inspect at certain times um, or perhaps um, if your colony is really dense with bees and you're getting in there often and you're having trouble removing the frames without squashing bees then you could risk uh, squashing the queen as well. So. While the answer is no, get in there and learn as much as you can. You also want to tune in with the bees and make sure you're being careful and gentle so you don't um, squash the queen. Great. Cedar, you may have mentioned it um, earlier, but we've just had a few people join us. Just wondering, you've added that super, the new super, on top of the super that was already full. Is there any reason for that why you don't put it underneath the super that's full? Uh, you could certainly put it underneath. Um, it's just from ease that I've put it on top really. Um, there is a trend in beekeeping to under super and um, because bees will tend to move honey up to the top further away from their entrance so you might save them some work by putting the super underneath the super that's currently full. Fantastic look and I think my computer's overheating. I think my computer definitely needs some snow here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to wrap it up. We're sweltering in the sun here. We're going to run for the snow in Michigan. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and thank you very much for all your questions. And please do let us know what you'd like us to cover. The idea is we're helping you uh, understand how to get started in beekeeping, taking away those, those barriers that stop you from, from getting in there and looking after your bees. And also tune in on the thread, help other people answer if you've got answers to people's questions. By all means, that's what it's all about. Don't be afraid to have a shot 